Hi guys, in this video, I'm going to cover the chapter two, which is the data of the macrotenants. So here, in order to talk about the data of macrotermics, I want you to recall three macrotermic goals. So the first one is achieve economic growth. And the second one is, is stable price level. And then the last one is low unemployment. So the first one, achieve the economic growth. So then the question is, how do we measure the economic growth? So we have GDP and GMP. You go deeper, then you have a real GDP, nominal GDP, real GMP, nominal GMP. And also you can uh, divide it by the population, then you have a GDP per capita. So we're gonna talk about that one, the first one. And then the second one, the stable price level, how do you measure the price? Well, we have the CPI, consumer price index, and we have a GDP deflator, which uh, comes from the concept the nominal and the real. I'm going to talk about the details later. And then the last one is a PC deflator, personal consumption expenditure deflator. Okay? So these are the three measures to uh, measure the price level. And then the last one, unemployment, uh, which we covered in chapter one. Unemployment, basically, you can uh, find it, you can calculate it. So the numerator is a number of unemployed workers, and then denominator is a number of employed workers plus number of unemployed workers. And this denominator, number of the employed plus number of the unemployed, uh, that, is, that is a labor force. All right, so that's the big picture of this chapter two. So let's talk about the GDP, gross domestic product. So two definitions that we have, the first one is a total expenditure domestically produced of final goods and services. So let me highlight this one, total expenditure and domestically produce a final goods and service. But at the same time, there is another definition, total income on the by domestically located factors of the production. And I believe that you guys recall the factors of production. So that is same as a resource. So we have the four resources, land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship, right? And, but put it simply, uh, we mainly use a labor and capital to make it simple, okay? So we use a labor and capital to capture these factors of production to make a model and understand the macro -kinics. Uh, so we can use a land and entrepreneurship, but it's uh, not that easy. And it's a little bit complicated to embrace the, this land and entrepreneurship. So that's why we mainly use a labor and capital. Okay? And there's another definition that I can give you. So the GDP is uh, the total value of all final goods and services produced in an economy. During a given period, so it could, uh, so the highest frequency that you can achieve this GDP data is a uh, quarterly data, or you can also obtain the yearly frequency, but you cannot obtain the monthly frequency GDP. Okay, but then you can realize that the, by comparing the first one and the second definition, this says a total expenditure, and the other one is a total income. So that means that expenditure equals income. How does it? possible that how is it possible that expenditure equals income well if you have a very simple economy there is a person a and person b so person a uh he's making apple and he sell it to person b so person a when he sells the apple to person b he will get paid the dollars right so then the person a gets the income and then person b in order to buy the apple, he paid the dollars to the you know person A, right? So here, the expenditure from the person B equals income of the person A, right? So that's why the expenditure equals income because every dollar a buyer spends becomes income to the seller. So you can uh, come up with a very simple example, like two people in an economy, then you can understand why the expenditure equals income, okay? And there's a circular flow here. So we have a two agents, economic agents here, the household and the farms. So as a household, you work for a company, the farms, right? Then what happened? 
you offer the labor and as a result you get the you get paid right so you work for a company labor and then as a result you will get paid okay but at the same time in order to survive you need to buy something right so then you go to the company right and then you buy these goods and services right and here is an example is a bread and in order to buy the bread you need to pay so that's the expenditure okay so then from here, you can also check that the income equals expenditure, right? Now, value added. So value added is a value of the output minus value of the intermediate goods used to produce that output. So why do we need to study this value added? Well, from the definition of the GDP, I said that total value of the all final goods and services. And here you can see that the final goods and services. So that means that we cannot put the intermediate goods, otherwise it's double counted, right? So that's why we understand the value added. So take a look at an example here. So a farmer grows a portion of the wheat and sells it to a miller for $1. And the miller turns the wheat into flour and says to the baker, $3. Then what happened? How much value added? $2, okay? And then the baker used the flour to make a loaf of bread and says to an engineer for $6, how much value added? three dollars so you can capture the difference right so we can calculate the value added at each stage you can just check the difference between these two okay so then in the end we have the this definition again the gdp is a value of the final goods produced so some of the value added right so each step you can check the value added so then from the first oh uh, the first one first stage one dollar it becomes a six dollar right? so when you calculate the gdp you only use a six dollar you cannot put the this one dollar of the wheat and then three dollars of the flour okay all right and then here Oh, so this one is an expenditure components of the GDP. So you can decompose the GDP as a following. So the left-hand side, the value of the total output, that is a GDP. And GDP is the same as a consumption plus expend, uh, investment plus government spending plus net export. So C uh, denotes for the consumption, I denotes investment, G is a government spending, and NX is a net export. And uh, from the chapter three and four, so we're going to study the closed economy model first, open economy later. Then we are not going to cover the net export. So we're focusing on the closed economy, which covers the consumption, investment, and government spending. So later on, we're going to talk about the exchange rate and net export. Okay. But anyway, here, the expenditure components of GDP is a consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net export. And you can also check that here, the left-hand side, the value of the total output is the same as an aggregate expenditure. Output, the amount of uh, the value of the total output that you produce is the same as your expenditure, okay? Now, let's talk about the one by one, consumption, investment, government spending, and net export. So consumption is the value of the all goods and services bought by the household, uh, which including the durable goods, non-durable goods, you can see the difference. So durable goods, it lasts a long time, cars, home prices, so on and so forth. Non-durable goods, lasts a short time, food and clothing, right? And also we can have the service, like you go to the barber shop, you go to the nail salon, you have the dry cleaning, air travel, concerts. These are the services, okay? And then the consumption covers the largest components of the GDP. And here you have the GDP per person, which is around the $66,000, right? So that is about the 70% of the GDP, okay? So when you divide it by the GDP, I mean the consumption over GDP here, uh, sorry, the so consumption is actually the 45,000, right? And then the GDP is a 66,000. So 45,000 over the 66,000, then you can see that that's about the 70%. This is the largest component of the GDP. Okay? And we're going to talk about the characteristics of the consumption. And the thing is, a consumption is a relatively stable because there is a certain amount of money that you need to spend to survive. Okay? So it's, a, it's not the sensitive to economic situation. On the other hand, the investment is a very sensitive to the economic situation. And then the investment is about the 20%. Well, before that, so investment by definition, spending on capital, a physical asset used in future production. So this is a, the redundant equation, but it's good to know. So KT plus one is a capital in the next period is the same as a today's investment plus delta times a KT. 
So what does that mean? So KP, today's capital, would be depreciated. How much? This much. So like, uh, you know, the depreciation rate is a 0.8. What does that mean? So today you purchase a car, which is, a, let's say, the $10,000. Next year, it becomes a $800. So I'm sorry, $8,000. So today you purchase a car, $10,000 worth, but then in the following year, it becomes $8,000. What happened? Your car's value is depreciated, okay? But then you maintain a car, like you change the engine oil or something like that. That's an investment, right? So then it was $8,000, but having this uh, maintenance, it becomes $8,500, something like that, okay? So why do I introduce equation? Well, here, spending on capital. So your investment will become a capital, okay? That's why I introduced this equation, but it's too much, but it's good to know. And this investment has uh, includes business fixed investments so like the companies, farms, they spending on plant on, and equipment or places, that's a business fixed investment. And then the second one is a residential fixed investment. You purchase a house, right? That's a residential fixed investment and you pay the mortgage, that's easy. And then the last one is an inventory investment. So they're changing the value of the all forms inventories. So for example, Apple makes iPhones and then they have an inventory and they sell more than they expected then the inventories, uh, the, you know, the value of the inventories goes down and they sell less than the value of the inventories goes up because it goes to the uh, stock of the inventories. And then here is the data, 2019 investments. You see that the com consumption is about the $40,000, but then the investment is $11,000. So it's much less than the com consumption. So then you can see that here, when you calculate the percentage is about the uh, 20%. Actually it's less than 20%. And it's very sensitive to the, to the economic situation. Like uh, when we face economic investment goes up in general. When you face a recession, economic crisis, then this investment goes down. And we will see the data later. And then the next part is a government spending, third component. Again, I want you to recall, we are studying this Y equals C plus I plus G plus net exports. And the third one is a government spending for the government expenditure G. And here, before that, you need to understand the government, their spending and their income. Government's income is a tax and government spending is a G, government spending G, right? So like I told you before, when the T is a greater than G, that's a budget surplus. When T is a less than G, that's a budget deficit and T equals G, that's a balanced budget. And then this G includes all government spending on goods and services, such as a purchase of the train, installation of the subway lane. So that's the kind of investment uh, into the infrastructures, okay? And then G exclude the transfer payments, such as a 401k, pension, things like that, okay? So the stimulus check is actually uh, transfer payments, okay? And then again, the data 2019, the same as investment is about the 20%. So $11,000 of the government purchase per person. And you divide it by the GDP, then you can see that that's about the 18, uh, sorry, the less than 20%. And then the last component is a net export, which is a just export minus import. And in general, in the States, net export is always negative. So we import more than export then you can see that the net export is negative, which means that we import more than export. Okay. All right. Give me one second. All right, so let's talk about the expenditure output puzzle. So here's an example. Let's say that a farm produces $10 million worth of the final product, final goods today and puts, 10, uh, puts all $10 million in inventory. That means that they didn't sell it yet. But tomorrow, they sell only $9 million worth. So then they have a leftover $1 million. Then what happened? Does, it, uh, does this violate the expenditure equals output? And actually, no. The answer is no. So take a look. So also the output goes in, into the inventories and we actually assume that this company, they purchase their own 
unsold output. So that's why we still have the expenditure equals output, even if they didn't sell it to everything. Okay, so that's why still we have the expenditure equals output. I have this assumption. Now let's talk about the stocks and uh, versus flow. Stock is a quantity measured at a point in time, but then the flow is a quantity measured per unit of time. Okay, so then you can see that this uh, figure flow and stock. It's better to cover an example. So let me show you an example here. So then from this example, you get to know what's the difference between the stock and flow. So the first one. Stock a person's will and the flow is a person's annual saving. So every year you have the saving, right? But sometimes you make a ten thousand dollars per year, but sometimes you don't save, right? Or you can even spend more than your income, then your saving could be negative, right? But then the stock at certain point is a kind of cumulative ones, right? So a person's was. So for example, stock is a stay there, right? But then when you have the flow, it goes into the stock, right? So if this year you make a tons of the saving, then your stock, the, you know, your wealth level is an increase, okay? Now the second example is a more clear than the first one. So flow is a number of the new college graduate this year. So it's always possible, right? But then when you talk about the number of people with the college degree, so it's getting uh, you know, larger and larger. And this because this is a cumulative concept, okay? And then the last one is a government budget deficit. So every year US uh, face a budget deficit, right? Then what happened to the budget debt? Uh, government debt is uh, growing, right? So getting larger and larger again, the government debt is a stock and the uh, flow is a government budget deficit. But for example, what if that this year government face a budget surplus? So then this government budget debt is a decrease. Okay. And there are more examples in the following. So let me show you this one first. Okay. Here. Your balance on your credit card statement is a stock or flow? Well, that is a stock, right? So this this month you didn't spend that much, but actually you pay back, right? So then your balance will be decreased. But this month you spend much more than before, and then your balance of the credit card will be increased. That's a stock, right? And then the second one, how much time you spend studying a day, right? It's not a cumulative concept, so that's a flow. And then the third one, the length of the Spotify by playlist, that's the stock, right? So when you add the music or when you delete the music, the length of the Spotify uh, playlist will be changed. So that's a, you know, you know, cumulative concept. That's why this one is a stock. So the first one is a stock, second one is full, third one is a stock. What about the fourth one, the inflation rate? So inflation rate, you can calculate as following. So pi t is a pt minus pt minus one divided by pt minus one times 100. So this month's price level minus last month's price level divided by last month's price level times 100. Can you find the cumulative concept here? No, this is a flow. So every month is changed, right? So that's an inflation rate. So that means that this is a flow. Now the last one, the unemployment rate, that is a stock, okay? Why is that? So here is an employed worker and here is an unemployed workers. So when some people, uh, uh, you know, they lose their job, then it becomes an unemployed workers, right? But at the same time, some unemployed workers to get a job, then they become an employed workers. So this one is a cumulative concept, right? Goes in, goes out. So this one, the unemployment rate itself is a stop. Okay. All right. Now we saw that the GDP matches total income, total output, total expenditure. They are all the same in a simple economy and in equilibrium, they are the same, okay? And then let's talk about the GMP too. So here, GMP is a total income owned by the nation's factors of the production. On the other hand, the GDP is a in owned by the domestically located factors. So what does that mean, nation's factors of production? Well, you are the U.S. citizen, but then you go to somewhere else, like let's say the European country, and then you are making money from there. Then your income uh, from the European country measures as a GMP, okay? Because uh, you are a factor of production worker, right? Regardless of the where you work, your income uh, outside of the country in the states. Uh, I mean, the outside of the US, you're making money from the Asian country or the European country, your income 
as a measured as a GMP. Okay? So that's why we can have this equation, GMP minus GDP equals effective payments from abroad minus effective payments to abroad. So that is a net factor payments. So pretty simply, GMP equals a GDP plus net factor payment. So then what's the effective payments? So like I told you, your income wage or your profit uh, by having some business uh, or the land, interest and dividends on assets. Assets means like uh, you have the real estate or the uh, stocks or the bonds. That is the effective payments. Okay. So then the question is that, GMP is greater than GDP or the GDP is greater than GMP? It depends. Some country has a larger GDP or other countries there, they have a, a larger GDP. Okay. It depends. It's good to check. So I want you to check that countries are comparing their GMP and GDP and uh, think why that some country has a larger GMP than the GDP, uh, vice versa. Let me leave it to you. And then here, or you can read the textbook. And then here, oh, this is a very, very important near versus nominal GDP. So it's very simple, but very, very important concept. Nominal means that you don't take into account the price. On the other hand, the Leo means that you take into, take into account the price, okay? So Leo GDP measures the value of the using the prices of the base years. So that means that you control the price. On the other hand, the nominal GDP, you are using the current prices, okay? And here, I want you to know that very simple relationship. Uh, you can represent this real versus nominal always like this. Either real equals nominal over price, or you can take a look and you can change, uh, find the growth rate. But I don't, I don't want to talk about the details or this uh, the basic inco basic macroeconomics level. So the second one is that you take a log. So log R equals log nominal divided by price level by using the log property. Right hand side is a log nominal minus log price. So the famous example for the first one, well, the real wage, let me denote the lowercase w is the same as uppercase w, that's nominal wage divided by price. So you can use a Big Mac uh, price to capture the real wage. For example, uh, minimum wage is $15 per hour. That's a, a nominal wage. But let's say the price of the Big Mac is a $5. Then your real wage in terms of the Big Mac is the same as three Big Macs. Okay? And then here, the second one, uh, using the log, that, that is actually up, uh, approximately the same as the growth rate. And then the famous example that I have, that we have is the following. Real interest rate equals nominal interest rate minus inflation rate. And which is a very famous equation that is Fisher equation. So we're gonna talk about this one later. But the point is that I want you to know the relationship of uh, the real variable and the nominal variable with the price. All right, so then let's play with a very simple example. I uh, calculate the nominal GDP and the real GDP. So nominal GDP 2019. So we have a two goods only. So 2019 price of the good A is $30. Price of the good B is $100. And good A produces 900. Good B is a produce 192. So then how do you calculate the nominal GDP 2019? So nominal GDP 2019, that is same as good A, $30 times a 900 plus $100 times a 192, then that is a 46,200, okay? Likewise, you can calculate the nominal GDP 2020, 2021. So I already calculated, so you can do it by yourself. So, uh, but here, let me give you one more. So nominal GDP 2020, now the good A becomes $31 and then the quantity produced is a thousand plus $102 times 200. Then we have 51,400, okay? And then you can calculate the nominal GDP 2021. So then the, what's, the, what's the real GDP? Well, it says a real GDP using the 2019 as a base year. So that means that a real GDP 2019 is basically the same as a nominal GDP 2019 because base year is a 2019, right? So that being said, in the base year, nominal GDP, real GDP, they have to be the same. 
But now, when you calculate the real GDP is a 2020 and 2021 is changed, you need to up, you need to use a 2019 as a base year. So let me show you. So real GDP 2020, good A produced a thousand, right? But we are using the price of the 2019. So it's not $31, but it's the $30, okay? So we fix the price as a 2019. And then the good B, same as before, is $100 times the 200. So then the real GDP 2020, 2020 is uh, actually the 50,000, okay? So then uh, which one do we need to use? Real GDP or the nominal GDP? Well, in general, it's better to use a real GDP because you control the price. So there are two factors that uh, makes a change of the GDP, nominal GDP. One is a price and the other one is a quantity. So nominal GDP can be uh, increased when the price is increased. So then you don't know where it comes from. Is it because that the price is increased or is it because that we actually produce more, right? But when you are using the uh, real GDP because you are using the base year price, then you can capture we actually having the economic growth or not. So that's why here, real GDP controls for inflation. The changes in nominal GDP can be due to the changes in price or changes in quantities of output produce. But when you're using the real GDP, the change comes from the quantity only. So take a look at this data, US nominal and real GDP 1947 to the 2020. And here the base year actually 2012, right? So 2012 here, you see that the nominal GDP and the real GDP crossing because they have to be the same in 2012, okay? But they have the same patterns like over sloping, right? It's over time is growing. And so, other countries are probably the same. Over time, they are they having they are achieving the economic growth, then this GDP shows upward sloping patterns. Okay. And then by using the relationship between the this nominal GDP and the real GDP, you can extract the uh, price measure, which is a GDP deflator. So, like I told you, real equals nominal over price. So then here is a real GDP equals nominal GDP over the price. And that price is a, we call it the GDP deflator, okay? But here GDP deflator, we uh, having the base year, base year, the GDP deflator has to be 100. So that's why we need to multiply by 100, uh, sorry. So here, when you rearrange this equation, GDP deflator, then nominal GDP over real GDP times 100, okay? That's a one measure to capture the price level. So then we we'll take a look at this example. We already calculate the nominal GDP, real GDP 2019, 2021. Here, the GDP deflator 2019, it has to be 100, right? Because of, uh, nominal GDP over real GDP, they are the same. So that's why the 46,200 over 46,200 46, times 100, that is just 100. Again, the real GDP, uh, sorry, the GDP deflator is a nominal GDP over real GDP times 100. Then 2020 is nominal GDP 51,400 over 50,000 times 100. Then you can calculate the GDP deflator. That is about the 102.8. Okay? And then 2021, do the same thing. 58,300 over 52,000 times 100 then you can calculate that is going to be 102.12. And after that, you can calculate the inflation rate. Again, the inflation rate is PT minus PT minus one over PT minus one times 100. That's the inflation rate. So the first year, we don't have the data. So that's why inflation rate is not applicable. And then the second one, 2000, uh, sorry, the 2020 is 102.8, so that's this year price level minus previous price uh, level, the GDP deflator over previous price level times 100. Then you can see that that's just 2.8%, okay? And then 2021, 102.12 minus previous year, 2020, 102.8 over 102.8 times 100. Then you can calculate the uh, inflation rate. That is about the 9%. All right, so moving on, and here's the answer. 
All right, so understanding the GDP deflator. Well, so let me show you this one first. So GDP deflator, like I told you, nominal GDP over real GDP times 100. But then nominal GDP, you calculate the price of the good one times the quantity of the good one at, at time t, and then good two, good three, so on and so forth. Okay. But then you can uh, represent the following equation. And then what you, what you can notice is, here, this t is a changing over time, okay? So that's why the GDP deflator is a weighted average of the prices, okay? So the reason that I show you this one is there is a difference with the CPI and you will see what it is. And here, this is a, uh, helpful. So by using the local property, then you can see that percentage change in X times Y is basically the same as a percentage change in X plus percentage change in Y. So that is a, exactly the same as a log property. I mean, log A times log B is the same as log A plus log B. Okay? So for example, here, if your wage rise of 5% and you work 7% more than your wage income, so that is together is approximately 12%. So you don't need to recalculate it because by using this fact, you can easily calculate uh, your wage income, how much is uh, changed, okay? And then here, this division is same as a subtraction, the same as a log property, log A over B is the same as log A minus log B, okay? So if the nominal GDP increased by the 9%, real GDP increased by 4%, then the GDP, GDP deflator, because it, this one is a division, right? So the numerator increased 9%, denominator increased by 4%, then the GDP deflator will be changed, will be increased by 5%, okay? All right. So then let's talk about the CPI, consumer price index. So CPI is a measure of the overall level of the prices. And then these uh, Bureau of the Labor Statistics, they publish the CPI every month. So the frequency of the data is a monthly frequency. And they have a basket. So from the basket, they can uh, track the price of the basket of the goods. So every month it collects the data on the prices of all items and they check. So the CPI in any month, uh, we can calculate this way. Okay, so denominator is a base period and the numerator is a that month. We calculate the cost of the basket. So take a look, very simple example. Here, the basket, we have a 20 pizzas and the 10 lab boards. So then 2018, what's the CPI? Well, $10 times uh, the pizza is $10 and then we have a basket 20 pizzas, right? So the 10 times 20. So 2018, the CPI calculated 20 pizzas times a $10 and plus uh, 10 lead cores times a $15. So the basically the 2018, the CPI is 350, okay? So you can calculate that way. So 2019, price times the quantity, price times the quantity of the C, uh, pizza and the lead cores, you can find it. So here's the answer. So cost of the basket, but then the base year, uh, we set as a hundred, so that's why here basically you divide by three fifty, then you can have the CPI. Okay, so here three seventy divided by three fifty, then CPI is one hundred five point seven, so on and so forth. Then like we did before, by having the CPI capturing the difference again, PT minus PT minus one over PT minus one times hundred, then you can calculate the inflation. Okay? And then you may want to know the what's the basket here. And here is the basket. Housing, like the land or the mortgage, and then uh, education, how much you spend for the education, tuition, things like that, communication, recreation, food and beverage, apparel, medical care, transportation, and other goods and services. The largest component, as you can see, the housing, and then the second largest component is a food and beverage and the transportation. Yeah, uh, that's a CPI, basket. Now, here, so when you calculate the CPI, you see that here prices change, but then this, the basket is not changed. So that's why here there's no T. So that's the difference with the GDP deflator. So CPI is a weighted average of the prices, but 
these rates remain fixed over time. On the other hand, GDP deflator here, note that rates change over time. Okay? So there are pros and cons. So that's why the people use uh, both of them. And in fact, they're using the PC deflator too. So let me show you that one. Uh, let's talk about the pros and cons of this measure. So here, CPI may over ask, overstate the inflation because we have, there is a substitution bias, introduction of the new goods, and all measure change in quality. So substitution bias means that when the prices change, the people try to find the other options, substitutes, right? But then the CPI cannot capture that one. And then when there is a introduction of the new goods CPI, we are using the fixed basket. That's why there is a limitation. And then the last one is that when the quality is changed, that this CPI cannot capture it. So that makes the overstate of the inflation by using the when you are using the CPI. So in fact, CPI overstate inflation by about the 1.1% per year. Okay. All right. So moving on, so like I told you, there is a one, uh, one more measure, the PC deflator, but before that CPI versus GP, GP deflator. So you can see the difference between these two. So take a look. And then PC deflator. So that's the last measure to measure the price level. So that is a personal consumption expenditure deflator. So the ratio of the nominal to real consumption is spending. That's a PC deflator. So the PC deflator is a use a lot uh, when you capture the price, but in, in fact, uh, people use uh, the, this GDP deflator, CPI, PC deflator, everything. And when you take a look at the data here, they're moving in the same direction. But again, you can see that the CPI overstate, that's why it's, uh, you know, it's greater than the other two, okay? Uh, and one more thing, core inflation, Sometimes, uh, many times uh, when the central bank announced the inflation, they're using, they are referring the core inflation. Basically they exclude the food and energy prices because it's so volatile. And when you exclude the food and energy prices, we call it the core inflation. All right, so we have the one last thing. So we, so far we talk about the GDP to capture the, whether this, uh, whether a country achieved the economic growth or not. So you have the real GDP and nominal GDP, and you, you can also have the GMP, you can measure the GMP too. And then we talk about the price level, price measures. We have a GDP deflator, CPI, the PC deflator. And then the last one is the unemployment rate here. So employed by definition, working at a paid job, unemployed is uh, not employed, but looking for a job. So you want to get a job, but you didn't get a job yet. So then you are unemployed worker. Okay? And then the labor force, pretty simply number of the employed plus number of the unemployed and not in the labor force. Uh, it's basically not employed, not looking for work. So for example, retired workers or unemployed as I think discourage workers such as homeless people, right? They are not looking for jobs, so they are not in the labor force, okay? So then I have a question. If you work for a family business, then do, but you don't get paid. So you work for your brother, but you don't get paid at all. Then do you think that you are employed worker or the unemployed worker? And the answer is you are employed workers. If you work for a, uh, your family members, but even if you don't get paid, you still captures as an input worker. Okay? So take a look at the textbook. Uh, there are so many examples and details. I want you to read the textbook. All right. So then how can we measure the unemployment rate? So percentage of the labor force that is unemployed. So put it, with the equation, you can write down numerator is a number of the unemployed workers and denominator is a number of the unemployed workers plus the number of the employed workers. That is the same as numerator number of the unemployed worker divided by the labor force times 100. Uh, don't forget to uh, multiply 100 because this is a percentage. And then the labor force participation rate is a labor force divided by the other population. Okay. So let's take a look at an example here. Number of the employees is 150.24 million. Number of the employees is 9.72 million. Other the population is 260.66 million. Then the labor force is just summation of the number of the employee plus number of the unemployed. So that is a 150.24 plus 
plus 9.72. That's the labor force, which is a 159.96 million. And then the unemployment rate, number of the unemployed, 9.72 million divided by labor force, 159.96 million times 100. Then you can find the unemployment rate. That is about the 6.1%. And then the labor force participation rate, which is the labor force over the other two population. So the numerator, oh, sorry, I need to multiply by 100 because this is a percentage. So the numerator is 159.96 million divided by 260.66 million times 100, then you have a 61.37%, okay? All right, so moving on. So computing percentage change. So using the concept that we studied, so like I showed you, percentage change of the A times B is the same as percentage change of the A plus percentage change of the B. And percentage change of the A over B is the same as percentage change of the A minus percentage change of the B. Suppose that other to, so here, it has to be other to population. Other to population increased by the 1%, labor force increased by 3%, number of the unemployed persons increased by the 2%. And then the question asks you, uh, compute the percentage change the labor force participation and the changes, uh, the uh, percentage change of the unemployment rate. So the first one, percentage change of the labor force participation rate, that is a percentage change of the labor force divided by the other to population. And then the question says that, well, person, uh, so by using the property, it's a percentage change of the labor force minus percentage change of the other population, then you can find the answer that is three minus one, that is 2%, okay? And then the unemployment rate, percentage change of the unemployment rate, that is a percentage change of the number of the unemployed workers divided by the labor force. So that becomes a, uh, subtraction, right? Division becomes subtraction by using this property. So then percentage change of the unemployment, unemployed worker, uh, workers, and then minus percentage change of the labor force. Then this one is given as a 2%, percentage change of the labor force increased by 3%, so two minus three is a negative 1%, okay? So negative 1% means that unemployment rate is decreased, okay? All right, so that's a chapter two. So let me stop here.